This session is How J. Crew Uses AI to Delight Customers and Power Sales Growth. I'd like to welcome to stage Purva Gupta. She's the co-founder and CEO of Lilly AI, and Danielle Schmelkin. She's the Chief Information Officer of J. Crew Group. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a good round of applause for Purva and Danielle. All right, we're going to talk about AI as if we've not heard that 1,500 times in the last 48 hours, and as, as the founder of a company that has AI in its name, you know, we're gonna talk about AI. No, no, no. We're gonna talk about how J.Crew uses AI. And I think the reason I'm really excited about this conversation is, Danielle is gonna talk about the practical use cases of AI and how it's actually generating sales. And so, um, so as we get started here, um, quick backstory. My first memory of meeting Danielle a few years back, on the first call, um, you know, I, I was telling Danielle that Bloomingdale's is one of our customers and we're driving additional sales for them and the experience. And Danielle's reaction was, she actually started rattling examples. She's a Bloomingdale's customer, very quickly wore her consumer hat and was telling me the things that she was experiencing and that I very quickly understood that she's, she's certainly one of those leaders who's empathizing with the consumer very quickly, herself as a consumer, and then the J.Crew consumers. So tell us a little bit about your background and how your own personal experience sort of shapes your role as a CIO at J.Crew. Yeah, I love that. Um, first of all, I just feel like so often I've experienced people go to work and they put on their work hat and they forget that like, that's not how things work in the world and that's not how I think in my life and you mentioned Bloomingdale's, and immediately I'm thinking of, I, I had to go to, I don't remember if it was my niece or my nephew's wedding because they all like, got married around the same time. And I was looking for a very specific type of dress. I didn't know what I was looking for, but try and browse like Bloomingdale's full site. It's impossible, and I kind of knew a length I was looking for, and it needed to cover my shoulders because like I'm getting older. And you know, it was language that made sense to me. And you know, I had no idea that you guys were powering their site and really enriching the language that I could use to find. And I found a perfect dress. I did. And you think about like, OK, the way I searched for that dress is likely not the way you would search for that dress, right? And so I wanted like a midi length, and it needed to be at least short sleeve, and I wanted it to be black. And, but then I was very specific about like the kind of dress and nowhere in a product description or the like name of these products would I have found that. And so when we first spoke, I was like, oh, okay, well, they're the real deal because this is, you know, and just to take a step back, and, and my, my lovely J. Crew family is here, and you probably know, like, I don't do this. And Lily AI has been like such a tremendous partner and they're the real deal, which is why I'm like, yeah, we should talk about this. We should talk about this, this was because- was not planned, guys. No, no but, but it's real. And like, you're real. What you've built really allows any customer to think the way they think, right? And we have phenomenal merchants who describe our products and we have phenomenal product development teams who you know put together what these products are and we have amazing marketing and digital teams who are like getting our customers to come to our site right but we're not thinking the way every customer thinks and so how do you broaden the language that's available language may not be the word you know we talk about product attributes but how do we broaden the opportunity for a customer both to find what they want and make often what is a vast catalog seem much smaller and much more personal. You know, we don't really talk about personalization that much, but I think the foundation is what allows you to think in that personal way because again, the way I want to get to my perfect dress is probably very different than yours. So that's that's some of the backstory and um, We've done some great things from there. Yeah, and so I know uh, you're, you're not just gonna talk about the practical use cases, but you also have some slides and some images and some examples to show. Yeah, love to. Um, should we get into that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. 
Okay, so this, these are real world, and so like when we were thinking about what would make sense to kind of show you guys what are we talking about, really simple search, right? Button up shirt, and you see we got three results here, three. Now, if you know anything about J. Crew, <laughs> we have a few more, you know, and so, um, but. You know, and look, I don't want to pretend like there's a silver bullet and you just plug this in and like all of a sudden everything just opens up to you. However, by working with Lily, if we move forward, same search, 120 results, right? And so, you know, my gut says we probably have a little more than 120 also, but this was a point in time. And when we were talking, I tried to come up with just a couple of examples of things, A, your average customer would search for, but even in the next one in one second, like something that I would search for, but that our merchants don't describe that way. So this is great, this is great. So if you look at this, the before and after, on the, and I, I don't know my left from my right without doing the whole like L thing, but now it's behind me, so I think it's still on the left. <laughs> our merchants would have said, these are the three attributes that we're adding to this product, right? after working with Lily, these are the additional attributes that have been added to this product. And think about it, look at this. It's so these are things that we use in search, in filters, in the facets, and even for SEO. And so when you think about the way that you might search for this top, you might put, I'm making this up just by reading this, but like multicolor relaxed sleeve top. Right? You would never have gotten that from what is on the left. But in my brain, that's how I'm thinking when I'm trying to look for something. And so this was like a great example for us of the rich data that we can then put behind the scenes. And then we decide, do we want to expose this in filtering? Do we want to expose this just in search? Feeding SEO is like a big one for us because how do you even discover us in the first place if you're not someone who may be familiar with our brands? Um, this has been really great. And the next example was the one where it's like polka dot dress was the search. Nowhere in the title do you see polka dot dress and I'm not even sure if it's in the description of this dress where you would see polka dot. And that's okay, you can use your eyes, you would see it, but again, if you're if you're browsing through, could be 15 pages of dresses, you, you might give up after the first or second page if you're just not seeing what you want. And the ability, if, if you have any idea in your mind of what you're looking for, that shows up now. I'm not sure if we have any more. Oh, yeah. Um, the other thing that we were able to do you know, with this richness is actually power how we think about recommendations and how we think about potentially whatever product page or category page you land on, that's not quite right, but by knowing a little bit about what you've searched for or what you've filtered on, you can kind of see in these examples, we're able to surface up other potential recommendations for areas you might want to explore next. And so the recommendations for us, you know, we, we started just with attributes and yeah. probably just exposing two or three of them. Um, but we've really built this out once we've seen the lift that we could get and where our customers are interacting with these features. You know, we do a lot of testing, but this this was one that just immediately tested really well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I found this blue stripe button-up shirt right, right on the side. Hey, I have to use my own product like, She's like once head in a to while. Toe in J. Crew right now, and I absolutely, just, you look absolutely. Phenomenal. And hey, the search worked really well. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the to to also share with the audience a little bit, a little bit more about the status quo as others think about this. Um, you know, like typically what we have seen from my perspective, you know almost 99% of the brands and retailers I've met, this is happening manually today, where merchants are attributing the products, they're, they're looking at the search terms and manually trying to figure out what to add. And the way that we look at this is, it's actually manually impossible to do this. You're talking about you know, hundreds of thousands of search terms, you're talking about um, like the language of the consumer, Google Trends, lots of things. It's impossible to do manually, but like, 
How I, would you elaborate on that? I should have looked up the actual statistics, um, but I think we were able to have Lily attribute, keep me honest, like over 50,000 SKUs in, in like an hour. It's just, yeah. we could never do that manually. And the richness, if, if can you go back to the one where it was like the three versus yeah. the 15 attributes? Because well, it's not clicker. even just the, whatever. Um, it's not even just Ooh. the time and the scalability of it. Oh There's goodness. language that our merchants might just not use. And so, oops, I, it's all sorry. Right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Going to the it's wrong okay. session. There's language that our merchants might not even use. And so here we're going back. Yeah. That's magic, the magic. Right here, right here. Right? And so like there are attributes here. Look at, you know, occasion, next style. But even some of the fabrics, like here's where my merchant partners, don't tell them, but like sometimes they'll use names of fabrics that I, in my life, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that is and I don't have a clue how that would feel and how that would drape on my body and you know some of the attributes they're just again in addition to the speed the complete inability to do this manually the richness of consumer focused language i think has been really important and again maybe i could learn more about you know different fabrics but we shouldn't assume that our customers are going to, right? We need to put more language out there that speaks to them and how they think. And um, I, I think some of what you see here, even like trend study hall, like I, what? I don't know. I don't know how you come up with some of these, but they're just right. They're just right. And that's the other thing we are constantly like looking at it to say, well, actually, what's resonating? And are there things that we would include because we're seeing more uptick and we're seeing more customers interact with it. And are there other ones that may just not feel right for us? You know, so we're in control of that. We're always in control of that. But the, the speed and the scalability of it and the language have just been things we could not achieve on our own. Yeah, we remiss to not mention quiet luxury because that, that was the most popular thing everybody wanted to write about, talk yeah, about. Luxury. Our customers were absolutely benefiting from it because all the way from SEO, like when you were looking for quiet luxury, um, you know, it was showing up. And like, this is now possible with technology that, you know, trends like that can just go onto the product catalog, go all the way from SEO, SEM, on-site search, recommendations, filters, all the way up to demand forecasting. It can just all happen now yeah. um, with, with the use of AI. So perfect segue. And, and, and just before you do, like also allow your associates to focus on more higher value work, if you will, you know, yep. and, and not have an army of associates just manually, even if they could, manually attributing. Like how do we move them along to be working on what, what is more important for them to focus? Yep. Absolutely. So segue into AI here. I'm sure there is a gazillion things that you're seeing in AI, and you know, I, I feel like the, the syntax these days is what AI problem are you solving, which I find very funny. It, it actually needs to be what problem can you solve with AI and dramatically, right? But with that, like, what are some of the things that you feel really good about that you're seeing? You know, to, to like broaden the question just a little, and it's AI is just the latest, but I can think back probably a long time, whatever the buzzword of the moment was, it was, it was big data, and then it was cloud, and like everyone's like, well, sh should we be in the cloud? And you know, why aren't we doing NFTs? And like, why aren't we in the metaverse? And um, I think there's a lot of noise that's generated by some of this buzz, and what, what I've tried to do in other companies in here is say like, actually, flip it, and what are, what are scenarios that are um, opportunities for our company, and if that scenario is something we're trying to solve, here might be an application for AI in this example, right? And so like trying to back away from just the buzziness of the latest thing you're gonna hear about and the latest article that's gonna get forwarded to you by your CEO, um, it happens every day. Um, what are we doing to actually flip the conversation to here are some opportunities in our, in our business that we're trying to solve for and not and yes, AI comes into it, but 
to speak to AI. AI, again, it's like, what are you actually talking about these days? Because we've been talking about AI for decades, for real, but we've been talking really in the last six months about generative AI, and you know, now that's everything, and now that's like the topic du jour, and you, know, you have all of your different hats of, it's great, we should jump on it, it's scary, we should protect what we're doing, and what's public, and what's private, and how to think about it. Um, but again, it comes back to, what are we trying to solve? And so I think this is a perfect example where it's like, wow, think about your product domain. Of all of the data domains that we deal with in, in most companies and retail companies in general, like several of them will touch several areas. Product is the one that touches everyone, right? Everyone has a hand in product from like, initial ideation and in design and then sourcing and product development and how are we gonna um, get this to our distribution centers and how are we gonna um, put it on our websites and how are we going to price it and how are, there's, and it's international, so do we have a different way of thinking about it if it's international? And so knowing that product really touches everything, I think in, in many ways, and you're gonna argue with me, customers, more important. They're all important. Um, Product, if you get product right, all boats rise, right? And so I think that a clean and rich product domain, I, I grew my career hands to keyboard doing more analytics, like your traditional first data warehousing and BI and dashboards and get really excited about that stuff, and I still do. And everyone would push back on me, like, you can't have that much data, or like, you shouldn't have 200 product attributes on your goldfish at Pepperidge Farm. And I was always like, the more, the more questions you can answer or the more different ways you can think about, um, well, I see an opportunity in Rainbow Goldfish because like, they're being sold in, in all of these areas. And, but if I don't have that attribute where I know that it's rainbow, um, it's a missed opportunity. And now, people have mostly stopped pushing back on the size, and it's like, it is a breath of fresh air to be able to do product right. And so, going back to what we said a few minutes ago, like, it is not humanly possible to get it right at scale and with kind of the speed that you would need. And so, this is just one example of where we don't talk about AI. We talk yeah. about what are we trying to solve. Absolutely, and so the next logical question of like, what are some wins that you are seeing here that you could share with the audience? Um, you know, you, using AI, sure, but the problems that you're solving or focusing on. We're seeing, um, you know, for us, one of, one of the things we track is like how many products you view in a session, right? And we're seeing a higher product viewing rate and therefore a higher, add to bag, higher checkout. So yes, all of those numbers have gone up, but I think um, we, we have the stats all day long. Of course, I didn't memorize them, and, um, but I, I do think really being able to provide a more guided experience and get you to potentially what you want, and then really wanting you to come back. It's like, how do we stay in your consideration set? Why do I go back to Bloomingdale's? It's not because I'm loyal to any brands that they sell per se, it's that like I know that the experience that I am given when I go on their site is going to be a little less confusing, a little more guided, and get me where I wanna go. And so for us, it's of course it's about adding to bag and converting those customers, but it's also about what is gonna keep us in their consideration set to come back um, because, and, and you all, know this and do this, you know, retaining your customers, in my opinion, is, is way more important. Yes, we have to get new customers all the time, but if you retain, a retained customer is going to be your best customer. And so how do we keep in their consideration set? There's so many great brands out there selling great jeans and great cashmere. There just are. I think ours are great. And we just want you to think of us. And so what is going to keep you thinking of us? It's the experience. We're getting you to the right product. And so you'll come back. 
Great. And any surprising challenges that you've seen with, because you've been ahead of the curve here, you know, implementing lots of different things. I don't think, it, it wasn't technical. It was winning hearts and minds, right? And I think that's often the, the, the hump that you have to get over, which is like, let's just test it. I promise you guys, you have control. If it doesn't say what you like, we're not gonna put it on the site, but let's just test it. And let's test it behind the scenes where no customers can see it. Because there's, in very real and true ways, you know, everyone in our company feels just ownership and, and accountability for our success, right? And, and each department has their own way of doing that, right? And um, it's hard to prove out this is gonna be good, right? And so the testing of that and bringing some of our partners along for that and letting them really still, of course, be in control of the output there. We're not gonna put anything live if it doesn't feel right to you, but we gotta test it. Let's test it. So I think that for me has been um, the challenge, but it, it wasn't like a terrible challenge. It was really, we've, we've got some amazing partners who were like, okay, yeah, let's, let's test it. Yeah, and I think, especially in this environment, if, if, if there is a way to, um, you know, test it out and, like, prove the value and, like, deliver that, it, it, that's a winning combination yeah. for sure. So, so m moving on to the next thing, by the way, f for this slide, a little, a little plug on Lily, we actually do a lot more attributes than this to keep the cognitive load down. We just brought it to a few, but to um, what Danielle was saying, the synonyms, the language of the consumer, the way in which all the different ways in which a consumer might be looking for things is what we attribute on the product. But we wanted to just put the size. points. Um, we were... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> font, font size limitation to just keep it uh, to a few attributes. So then going into sort of the next question, um, which, which you touched on a little bit, as, as, um, as other leaders think about implementation of some of uh, these types of solutions, which are using AI or not, but like solving some of the core, core problems with dramatic results as a promise, what are some of the suggestions that you have for folks in the audience who are considering these types of solutions and others? Um, because there's a lot of hype. Like how, how do you stay focused and figure, like again from a testing perspective, you could do 10 different tests and pilots and you know, every vendor is gonna be, be offering a way to do that. How do you, like, how did you stay focused and like, what's your advice to other people who are considering this? I think, you know, one of the things that worked for us here, even in that first meeting, we spoke about this, like, it just, it felt like, ooh, you were onto something here. And so, in, in my gut, like, it just was like, this is, this is worth taking a shot on. But we started small and we just said, we're not gonna try and boil the ocean with this. And I, I think I or others have fallen into traps where like you try and do all of it, or it's like, or you're building your roadmap to all of it. And it's like, if we can just do, because I'm gonna get this wrong, but we probably, we did it on one brand at first, and we yes. did it with like on -site three search. attributes. Yeah. Right, on-site search was absolutely first. So it was like, you couldn't even see it, right? We were just hoping that if we had more rich data that was searchable, you'd get better results. And then we, we exposed like three attributes. And I remember being like, just expose them all. And then I had, you know, correct and well-meaning individuals on the team were like, no, we're not gonna expose them all. Like, that's not the way to do it. And I think we started small, we showed results, and then we expanded. And like, that would be my advice for, for anything, not just Lily, it's like, do a proof of concept, just pick one narrow thing you're trying to prove out, and if it works and it feels like it's scalable, um, do a little more. And so that, that for, for this, it's been really successful. We have a couple of other vendors where we've taken the same approach and it's been successful that way. So don't boil the ocean. Yeah, totally. Anything else you'd like to add, Danielle? Um, no, I'll just go back to, you know, I just think Talking about Lily, we've done so much, and I know we're still scratching the surface. When I think about the product domain, we have scratched, it's amazing, and we've just scratched the surface. Like, I want to take this downstream, upstream, on things that aren't even part of what we're solving for today. But how do we make a quicker 
and better experience within our company in areas that we haven't even touched. And I really think there's opportunity there. Um, and so, like, I, I would leave with that. And we, we've started speaking about, like, where could you see the tentacles and really solve for, like, a domain that is not without its challenges? Absolutely. And especially in this day and age with, with uh, you know, with all the challenges that are happening on, um, with the iOS, et cetera, like, product data is becoming this new, new sort of focus area of what it could unlock about the customer if it's done right. I know you're... Your, uh, the term, one of the terms that your team has been using is customer listening, is a way to understand the language of the consumer appended on the products and then take it into all different parts of the stack. And I think the, the other interesting thing about that is, like you said, like product goes, it just touches so many different pieces in the retail stack, which is sort of generally house of cards. Nothing is talking to each other. There's like so many things going on there, but like, trying to do something where it's, it's sort of sitting outside, not in front of the customer, and is, is still enriching and supercharging all the different parts in the stack. I think that's the other power of this. Um, yeah, and I think this might be controversial to say, and I might have a different opinion in a different company, but at the end of the day, even though we want the experience to be the best it could be, customers are coming to us to buy products. Right? They are not coming to us generally to be entertained, right? And so there are other brands and who are, you know, retail brands dipping their toes in other more, you know, metaverse -y things. And that's great. I don't know if that's authentic for who we are at this moment, and that's great too. Um, and so at the end of the day, if we get this right, we're solving the need that our customers are coming to us for. And I always want to keep that in mind, which is like, what is authentic for why you're coming to us? And how do we then double down on making that the absolute best it could be? Absolutely. Great. So I know we have five more minutes for questions. Um, so if anybody would like to ask Danielle a question or, or me. Or Perba. Very happy to. Yes, please. It would be great to get an overview of the AI. Like, what is your, how are you using AI? I understand a little bit about generating SEO terms, but can you talk a little bit about a broader view of what the sort of what the product is? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just describe it briefly. We're bridging the gap between merchant speak and consumer speak in retail. So merchant speak is when uh, you know merchants are describing products as midnight French Terry activewear, and consumer speak is navy blue sweatshirt and they're not finding it, right? So motion speak is very important from an inspiration perspective. We all know that. We didn't know if we needed a, you know, ox blood red handbag. Yes. It's, it's, it is really important from an inspiration perspective, but then the attributes, the manually put labels on a product, I feel like this is the dirtiest secret in retail. Those three, four attributes per product are going into every system in sort of the so-called retail stack. And so, um, we are basically using AI to do image recognition on the product catalog, take the product images, um, do image recognition on that and, and NLP on, on whatever text is available, and then generate the attributes. This is sort of like the core set of attributes. And then based on the application those attributes are going into, there are different formats and further things that we add to it. So like for example, filters and facets, you need only so many attributes because you want to keep the cognitive load low on the number of filtering, like filters for like search, on-site search, you need a lot of synonyms because consumers can look for a product in so many different ways, and so all that can go and sit in the search index. And so, and then similarly for SEO and for demand forecasting, item setup, all different types of use cases where product data is used today, there is enriched feed, more customized for that application that we are generating, so retailers and brands don't have to do any post-processing on it, just put it in your existing system, whether it's homegrown, whether it's modern, whether it's somewhere in the middle, just it'll supercharge the existing system. Awesome, thank you so much for your time, guys. Um, thank, thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you. Yeah.